Support for the Lancast is provided by Winding Way Books, Ryan Hess, and Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. Welcome to the Lancast. I'm David Moulton. And I'm Becky Svensson. Joining us this episode is Charlie Schroeder, author of the book Man of War. Man of War is a book chronicling Charlie's adventures through learning history in reenactment. My first reenactment, I marched six miles, a forced march with 20 pounds of gear on my back. I hadn't slept the night before. The temperature dropped to 20 degrees, and I was like, okay, this is the moment when I stop complaining about anything else in my life, because no, <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> this is terrible. Like, nobody told me it would be like this. You know, <laughs> this is terrible. You see, you guys a bunch of Nazis, and they were. <laughs> <laughs> we also learn a little bit about Charlie's approach to the writing process. And I wanted just to capture them right from the very beginning. And, and one of the things that I did, I mean, uh, I'd go into bookstores and I'd pick up a book. And I would look at the first chapter. And I'd read the first chapter. And if the first chapter didn't grab me, I'd be like, I'm never going to buy that book. I got really, really particular about this. And maybe it's unfair to do that. But at the same time, I re- realized that people have so many choices. You know, they don't have to read a book. I'm asking them to do a lot to do this. That's a long commitment to read a book. Um, so what I wanted to do was grab them right from the very beginning and say, you you must continue to read this because what's going to happen to me? Enjoy the conversation. Well, Charlie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, David. This is fun. Yay. <laughs> I'm on the Lancast. <laughs> We're going to talk about your book, Man of War. Uh, could you just give us a little description of what this book is all about? Yeah, it's hard to do a little, a little description because, you know, I've been talking about it now for a while and I tend to just go on. But basically, this was my opportunity to learn about history by living it. So the book is basically sort of my quest to learn about history by reenacting my way through it. So I embedded with all these different reenactment groups all across the United States. But it's also about the hobby itself. So why do people like to dress up as Romans? Why do people like to dress up as Vikings? Why do people like to dress up as Civil War people? All this, all these questions, you know, that I had. But in essence, sort of the through line, the narrative through line, is my uh, lesson, my, my quest to become a more, a better, you know, member of society by knowing more about the past 2,000 years of Western civilization. So does that mean you would describe yourself as someone who was very ignorant of, of history? or Yes. I <laughs> would very much wow. describe myself as an ignoramus. Like, so I grew up in uh, Brickerville, Pennsylvania, which to your listeners of, of the Landcast, they probably know is in northern Lancaster County. And I grew up in a log cabin that was built in 1740. I grew up next to Amish people. So history was really always a part of my life growing up, but I took it for granted, like most people do when you grow up in a a historically rich area of the country like Lancaster. And so when I moved away uh, to Los Angeles, where I currently live, and, you know, I didn't see any of that, or I told people I grew up next to Amish, and the looks on their faces were just like, what? You grew up next? I'm like, yeah, they, I don't even know the Industrial Revolution happened. It's amazing. You know, I, it was for the first time in my life, I really kind of realized how unique um, my upbringing had been, and also how unique this area is of Lancaster. It's a very historically rich area, and until you sort of get out of it, you're not even really cognizant of, of just how unique a place it is, and I realized that I didn't know much about it, and I wanted to learn more, um, not not just really kind of about my local area, which I did, but um, about the world in general and about history in general. How far back did you decide to go with this journey? Well, one of the things with reenactment, with historical reenactment, is that it really, in the U.S. at least, it dates back to about ancient Greece. So we're, lo- we're looking at like, you know, maybe 300 B.C., where people are dressing up as Spartan warriors. But there aren't really any battles with the Spartan warriors. You know, like the movie 300, you know, like those dudes, you know. So it doesn't, doesn't really go back that far where there's enough of them to have like a battle somewhere in America. But there are Romans. So I actually, the farthest back I went was to AD 43. So I hit my little time traveling machine, booked a flight on American Airlines, <laughs> ended up in Memphis, Tennessee, took a rental car to Leif, Arkansas, population 385. And I was there at Castra Leif. I have a very interesting segue about Castra, by the way, but Castra is the word, the Latin word for fort, Lancaster, oh. 
Oh. Castra, Westchester, anything with a, 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 a suffix um, in that vein is named after a fort. So originally Lancaster uh, from England is the name of, a, of an old fort town. So uh, Castra Leif, to re- bring it back to my adventure, uh, these guys have built a 26,000 square foot replica Roman auxiliary fort in their backyard in Arkansas. <laughs> and so I was there for a weekend reenacting Rome's invasion of Britannia in AD 43. So it was like a the, good one. It was a good one. Yes. I mean, you know, if anybody had told me what happened in the AD 43 before I went there, I'd be like, ah. <laughs> like what? Julius Caesar. I don't know. Like, you would have no idea. Um, but uh, so, yeah, these guys every year, all these Roman reenactors and Lorica segmentata, they call them, you know, body armor and helmets. They all congregate at this place and they just beat the crap out of Celts. <laughs> and who signs up to be a Celt in a losing battle? <laughs> right, exactly. Um, well, that's a good question. I, I think um, people who perhaps are, you know, people gravitate to different moments in time for different reasons. Sometimes it's, you know, heritage. If you've got some Celtic ancestry, you know, you might be attracted to that. Um, And typically, uh, from what I found at that particular event was that people who are, uh, have some sort of heritage or connection to this ancestry, whether it was Scotland or Ireland or where have have you, is that a word? Yeah. Um, What have you? Uh, Where have you? I just made up a new word. Shakespeare made, he invented, I think, 1,800 words. I think he invented... I You're make, on one. I can make one, <laughs> starting with where have you, um, what have you. Anyway, so they, yeah, they are the the ones the, probably who are attracted to it. But you know, with, with battle reenactments, you always need a winner and a loser. So you, somebody always has to play like the quote bad guy or you know whatever the enemy. So it you know it depends. Sometimes people will you know wear different uniforms. They'll quote galvanize. So like, you know, you'll have like a civil war, you know, and these guys one day will they'll be dressed as Confederates and the next day they'll be Union or whatever. But it's only to balance out the sides because so many people want to do Confederates and mm-hmm. which we can get to later. <laughs> what percentage, I'm guessing, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, would be I am I am um would you say a Celt? Celt. I'm a, I'm a Celt. Like the Boston Celtics? Not in the right pronunciation. I, I'm always insecure. <laughs> Appalachian, Appalachian, Appalachian. I'm sorry. Exactly. No, it's okay. I don't know. We're allowed to have these debates. And you know what? Let's look it up in a dictionary and figure it out for ourselves. <laughs> but I'm, anyway, I'm pretty sure it's Celt. If, if you are of Celt heritage, I, heritage, I'm of the Viking line. And I'm okay. so excited to get to that part where we yeah. talk about... I don't know any Viking battles, but I would never admit that a Viking lost anything. So. <laughs> I'm sure they those... lost a lot of things. Let me tell you, <laughs> sadly. Um, yes. Well, th- th- so your question. I'm sorry. Um, oh, so there are other people out there who have absolutely no personal connection to a group of people, but they just love the Romans. Or they Correct. Just... Yeah. Okay. Like they're not, you know, have any sort of like, you know, uh, Italian ancestry or whatever, but they're attracted to it because for the Romans, for the people, a lot of people who are attracted to the Romans and you'll find regionally across the United States that people are attracted to it for different reasons. Like so in Southern California, where I live, people uh, who are part of Legion Six Historical Foundation, which is one of the clubs out there, the Roman clubs, one of the guys who is in the club is like a rare an- antiquities coin dealer. And so he's fascinated with, you know, just the whole structure structure of the society and the fact that, you know, the, the, the sort of the art and commerce behind it. Whereas in the deep South, you'll find that people are attracted to it because of the Romans are in the Bible and they'll actually dress up mm. and in armor and they'll go to churches and put on like passion plays and stuff like that. So, you know, it just all sort of depends, you know, with a, with anything that is a historical recreation, you know, you'll gravitate to something that's probably reflective of your own life, you know. Um, Some people are attracted to Rome because they had this amazing military. And so you have former military guys who are just like, well, you know, Rome had the greatest army of the day. What would it be like? What what does it feel like to wear a helmet? What does it feel like to wear a chest armor? What does it feel like to march in sandals? What does it feel like to do these, you know, defensive moves and, and formations? So I think there's, you know, kind of what you're interested in, you know, in your own day-to-day world is reflected in, in how you choose to, uh, which po- time period and also in which to, uh, way you choose to remember it as well. How deep 
in general do these groups get into reenacting? Like, do all of them go full out, like sleeping <laughs> on the grass, or is it like is there like hotels making fortunes off of these guys? I feel like I feel like this is a time for me to imitate Colonel Bob. And Colonel Bob was the the, the the book is sort of structured. Each chapter is its own reenactment or its own event, right? So uh, chapter one is I'm a German in World War Two in Colorado where it's 20 degrees. And so for chapter two, I'm like, well, that's crazy. I don't want to get hypothermia. I'm going to go to Florida and I'm going to reenact the Civil War there because who would ever think of the Civil War in Florida, you know, in the same sentence? You don't think of it, but I wanted to do it. And when I got there, one of the reasons why I wanted to go to Florida was that much warmer. Like, I didn't want to freeze again. And I met this guy, Colonel Bob, and Colonel Bob was the head of our regiment or whatever. And he was like, we don't sleep on that cold ground. You know, like, he was like, we don't go for that sleeping on cold ground stuff. So they sleep in campers or whatever. So it really is all depends on the individual. You know, some people, they want an immersive experience, and it gives them something that's called a period rush. And that's the kind of, like... I was there, you know, I actually saw what it was like, you know, at Fort Niagara in 17, you know, 59 during the French and Indian War or whatever. And so a lot of people, they want to feel as though they've actually, you know, passed through the space-time continuum. Other people are doing it for camaraderie or for other reasons, and they're just like, I don't want to be uncomfortable. That's crazy, you know. <laughs> so it, it really just all depends on the individual. Did you run across any people who were in character... 100% during the whole duration of the that, event? That's a great question because, you know, I started off as an actor and, you know, I usually if I put on a costume and reenactors will say very specifically, do not call what I wear a costume. It is a uniform. <laughs> okay, so you have to be really careful. Like, this is not, you know, this is not play acting in, them, in, their, in their mind, although it, it can be. But most people just... They were themselves. Um, although, when I did the Roman reenactment, what I found to be so fascinating was that people would break an in and out of character at this, like, the drop of a hat, and you wouldn't know, like, you know, at one point they were just being, like, Dave, and then the next time they were, like, Flavius, you know, and it was like, I couldn't tell, like, the, the rules, like, where, <laughs> where's the script, you know, or there was this one moment when I was in a, 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 a tent, and I was working on the laces of my, of my sandals, and I was just all by myself, and there was just a, these two guys right outside the tent, and one of the guys, one of the Romans came to the, like, the centurion or whatever, the legionnaire comes to the centurion, and he goes, he's like... I killed this Celt, my lord, and I bring you his clothing. And he brought, like, you know, and I was, like, looking around. I was like, nobody's watching them. Like, there's no audience. You know, there's no, there are no spectators. And I, they didn't know I was there. And I was like, wow, that's fascinating. Like, I mean, you know, there are rules as, like, an actor because there's an audience and there's a script and there's a director and there's the actors and all this other stuff. And there it was just kind of like willy nilly, you know, it was like one second they would be John and the next time they would just break into like, you know, first person. So yeah, I mean, that was like the best example of that where I was just amazed that they were sticking to a script that apparently nobody else knew existed, you know? And I, re I discovered that at a so-called private reenactment, which is a reenactment that happens on private property, it, it typically an event that didn't happen in the United States, like Rome, that, you know, you were not only the participant, but you were also the audience member. So at the same time, it was like this weird sort of improv for nobody, improv for yourself. And so you were you know, taking on this role, and you were kind of entertaining yourself as you were doing it, but nobody else was watching it, like critiquing your performance or whatever. You know, this <laughs> this makes me think how historical reenactments like this, even Rome and what was it, Arkansas that you were in? Uh, Rome, Rome was in, it was in Leif, Arkansas, population yes. 385. So Rome and Arkansas with these this kind of reenacting for your own personal enjoyment and then yeah. you think of like people who do larping right sure and how larping is looked so down upon right but it's kind of the same thing yeah I there's mean, it's a, different a, totally different but it's also kind of the same or sca society for creative anachronism which isn't his, isn't necessarily his, you know historically accurate it's more like what the middle ages could have been or should have been or or even renaissance fairs for that matter you mm -hmm. know um and yeah, there is uh, there are fantasy elements, hu huge fantasy elements, and you know you cannot deny that when you dress up in some of these uniforms, that you look far more remarkable than you do today. You know, I'm wearing a t-shirt and you know shorts today and a baseball hat, and 
I don't look very glamorous, let's just put it that way. But, you know, if I were to go out there and I was to wear, you know, a waistcoat and, you know, uh, little, uh, you know, uh, breeches and, you know, buckled shoes and a nice hat, you know, you start to take on this role. And what, one of the things that I found is that it is role playing and it is a chance for people. And one of the interesting things about it is that people can shift in their socioeconomic um you know, in, in, in their, where their strata and where they are in real life. And so oftentimes what you'll have is people who are doing it and during the week, they're the boss and they'll say, you know what, on the weekend, I don't want to be the boss. I want somebody to tell me what to do. So I don't know if that's S and M or what exactly, <laughs> but they're kind of like, you know what? I just want, I just want to take orders. You know, I don't want to have to all this responsibility and, and whatnot. And so there's, there's definitely like a psychology to the role playing. Um, and also for people of maybe a lower socioeconomic scale, they can be the general or they can be the guy wearing the, the very fancy outfit for that weekend. And, and they can be treated with respect from all the people who come there. And so there is a f- interesting thing. What happens when you slip on something. I mean, the other day I went to a wedding and I had to wear a blazer and I was like, it's like the fashion equivalent of classical music. It's like my IQ points just <laughs> shot through the roof. You know, I feel <laughs> I'm so much more intelligent now that I'm wearing this. And that's what happens when you put on different clothing. It changes the way that you think, feel, and behave. Are these always very well organized or do you go to some and all of a sudden they kind of like falls apart really easy and to go in hand with that i just imagine you go to the renaissance fair or like um plymouth rock or something right and there's all these people dressed up in the period and sometimes they like really into it and sometimes they look really bored like they're just like oh it's hot i don't want to be here yeah so well you know i have to give most of them credit i you know for the people who organize these things that I, at least that i experience i mean they takes it takes a lot of coordination especially when you're dealing with guns mm-hmm. and, and and you're not i'm just talking about my muskets i'm talking about like cannons that can do some serious serious damage just by shooting blanks you know you could i mean i heard a story about a guy getting his hand blown off and they found his hand 200 yards down the battlefield still in his glove you know um so particularly where it involves safety you know by and large i would say that that's all pretty well organized um and that people really take that seriously because you can have major accidents and these people they want the reenactors they want to continue to do this hobby so if there are any accidents you know it, it it's looked down upon and the chances of them being able to do it again just went down um i know for example i just talked to somebody i was at gettysburg a few weeks ago and they were talking about the 150th which is coming up next year which is going to be bonkers you know they're gonna be like a hundred thousand people there and um that i think i think they've been planning that i don't quote me but you know for a few years they've been planning that particular reenactment because Everybody who's ever done Civil War reenacting and has, you know, fatigues or, you know, uniform from that, they will be there. And they will be coming from all over the world because that will be, it's like the Woodstock for reenactors. <laughs> and they are going to be there and it's going to take an, an immense amount of coordination because you're dealing, you know, you've got horses, you've got can, you, you, a lot of things can go wrong. So um, typically, yes, things are well organized, but you can never account for weather. You know, I mean, certainly, you know, people will say, oh, you know what? It's going to rain tonight. Let's just stop right now. But um, by and large, I would say that they were all pretty well organized. So especially in cases when they are of that magnitude, who who is funding this? Is there a membership fee or is there like a, a foundation or people giving yeah. of their hard-earned money just to see this go on year after year? Well, typically this is all self-financed, you know, I mean, it, typically in terms of the hobby, you know, so... Let's say, for example, you're a member of your local Civil War club here. I mean, you're paying for your own uniform. You're paying for your gun. You're paying um, – there might even be dues, you know, in your in your club, um, in your unit. And then if you're moving on, like, for example, uh, to a, a larger event, um, I've you know, you have to pay a certain amount and you have to sign a waiver to make sure that if, you know, the liability and all this stuff. The, I think there are different rules based on public events versus private events. You know, private events tend to be much more sort of like, hey, let's just go do this in our backyard kind of thing. And, you know, the liability thing is maybe to to release the owner from any obligation or whatever. But the public events, you know, they'll be contributing. The public pays for that. They're typically fundraisers for local historical societies. So, again, it's like this sort of public-private thing. Typically, uh, for the public events, you know, they're held near or on the battle sites, Hence, they are uh, fundraisers for those places. So not only does the public pay, but the reenactors will actually have to pay themselves, I believe. Yeah, I've, I had to pay for a few of those. Um, 
But uh, in terms of the financial uh, outlay, I mean, that's all coming from the reenactors. I mean, it's an, it can be a very expensive hobby. I mean, just to buy a musket could cost you, you know, hundreds, if not a thousand dollars or whatever. So, and there's really very little chance that you're ever going to get paid. You know, some people do background work in history channel, you know, documentaries or whatever movies, but you know, it's pretty much like any hobby, you know, it's a lot of money out and not much money in. So I'm really curious to know how the violence goes down. I've never been anywhere near a reenactment. I mean, I've watched a few documentaries, but especially hand to hand. And if you're not really trained, is that awkward? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> somebody asked me that. I did a reading the other night in Pasadena, and somebody said, what did you learn about yourself from writing this book? And I said, I realized I am not a soldier. I mean, <laughs> I went AWOL in a reenactment, you know? Like, I oh. was out of there after nine hours. I was like, you guys it's are... realistic. I was like, you guys are crazy. Um, yeah, it depends. You know, the hand-to-hand stuff, typically that's... Uh, Jeez. I mean, when we did the hand-to-hand stuff, it was mostly when you were reenacting an era that didn't have any guns. So, I mean, there are rules for how you're supposed to quote-unquote die. People don't always follow them very well because people don't want to die. You know, they want to keep shooting their gun. I mean, that's a lot of, uh, you know, that's part of the fun, you know, quote-unquote, for a lot of people is to fire these weapons, you know, because you're firing muskets that are really intricate. But for, like, Rome, for example... There are no, you know, there's no guns, you know, there's no cannons, anything like this. So, um, yeah, that's very awkward. In fact, you know, very quickly, um, I think like two minutes into our battle at Rome, we had to wear protective eye gear, which was like anachronistic, but I think that was maybe the only, you know, and we had sort of padded weapons. Our swords were made out of needle felt, which is an automotive grade felt. And um, somebody took their pila, which is a javelin. You know, they're like no below the belt guys, you know, basically like, you know, be, be, you know, dial it in, you know, if you feel like you're getting really angry, dial it back to a six out of a scale of one to ten. And so it's basically as soon as this thing starts, people just start beating the crap out of each other. You know, it's like there's absolutely nobody can censor themselves. We're just either throwing stuff as, as hard as we can. Some guy, and so like two minutes into it, this guy gets hit in the eye. Fortunately, he was wearing protective glasses with a javelin, which is blunt t- tipped, but it had a contusion, you know, because the plastic hit under his cheek, you know, his cheek or whatever, and he dropped, and we had to call a time. We were like, medic, medic. <laughs> you know, we had to call a timeout. It is very awkward, yeah, and very dangerous. We were storming the fort because the Celts had taken over the fort, you know, <laughs> and they were dropping 30-pound bales of hay on people from 10 feet. Now, I'm not a physics major, but that's more than 30 pounds when it hits you. And it became this very controversial thing. And like all their Yahoo message boards after the you know reenactment, people were like, that was ridiculous. Whoever was doing that should never be allowed to do this again. Because it's really, I mean, you could break somebody's neck probably. You're wearing 25 pounds of armor on your chest and eight pounds on your head. So, you know, something like that, it's hard enough just to walk around literally, you know, with this stuff on you to have a thing of hay, you know, crashing down on your head. So, yeah, it's it's very awkward. Most of the people who do this hobby are not in the best shape. You know, we're too old to be soldiers. There are a lot of middle-aged guys with beer guts and all those other things. And, mm-hmm. you know, if nobody can, nobody's gone through boot camp, um, at least not for this particular battle. So very easy to get hurt. I mean, my first reenactment, I marched six miles, a forced march with 20 pounds of gear on my back. I hadn't slept the night before. The temperature dropped to 20 degrees, and I was like... Okay, this is the moment when I stop complaining about anything else in my life because not, <laughs> this is horrible. This is terrible. Like nobody told me it would be like this. You know, <laughs> this is terrible. Yes, you guys are a bunch of Nazis, and they were. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's time for us to go to break, but when, when we're back, we will have some more time with Charlie. Hey, everybody. We're here at Penn Cinema to find out what everyone's been talking about. Excuse me, why do you choose Penn Cinema? I like the seats. They're really comfy. <laughs> They're a lot nicer than most other places. Even my house. <laughs> oh, well, this place is great. I mean, it's popcorn. We've got some, uh, we got a slushy machine over there. Found some, we got three clots. Three clots for the Lidditz, the Lancaster, and the effort of time, just in case, you know, you don't know what time it is in your area. That's why I love this place. They, they, they think about everybody, you know? Very friendly. Has a nicer environment. It's clean and comfortable. It feels independent. You know, like, it doesn't feel like part of a system. Like, it feels like as big as it is and as polished as it is that it feels independent, you know? Bigger screen, better quality. So it's really close. It's very clean. We come here all the time. 
What do you like about Penn Cinema? The seats are my favorite thing. Very comfortable. On the rump. <laughs> 3D IMAX, the whole shebang. It has a down-home feel, and we love the atmosphere that Penn has created. He really tries to take into account what people want in a theater. It's really clean, and the seats are really comfy. <laughs> yeah, I like the seats. It's the best movie theater to come to. Well, you've heard what they have to say. Now come see for yourself. Check out Penn Cinema for first-class movies in a first-rate theater. Located at 541 Airport Road in Lidditz, PA. And we're back on the Lightcast with Charlie Schroeder, author of Man of War. Uh, we're going to start gearing towards the actual writing part of this book. Before we get into it, Charlie's going to read a little bit of the book. I am. This is from Chapter 1. Uh, it's called Sleepless in Stalingrad. This was my first reenactment. And I'm just going to read it. Um, bang. The Russian sniper had been perched up in a tree, about ten feet off the ground and shrouded by branches. I hadn't seen him from where I was, 150 feet away, half crouched over in bone-dry reeds. The only indication that he was there, straddling a thick bough, was the burst of fire I saw shoot out of his rifle. It flashed quickly, like a small, angry dragon. Because the spark was so vivid, so direct, more yellow than orange, I knew that his weapon had been aimed at me. A few hours earlier, I'd been told by the reenactment organizers that if I saw such a pointed conflagration, it meant that I'd been killed. Now it was time for me to take what one of my fellow combatants called a dirt nap, which I was more than happy to do, because my back was killing me. After an hour-long break in which I unwisely lounged under a tree within spraying distance of an incontinent stallion, I was back on my feet marching with my fellow soldiers up a long, dusty road. But I'd rather have been dead. Dead meant sitting down by the side of the road and chugging water. Dead meant resting my feet and massaging my calf muscles. Dead meant taking a time out from being a grunt. It wasn't the three-mile hike that crippled me and made my back seize up. It was the lugging of twenty pounds of military gear. A rifle, sea rations, canteen, shovel, parts of a tent, sixty blanks, gas mask canister, mess kit, and my rolled-up greatcoat. Had I been to the gym in the last three years, it might not have affected me all that badly, but I hadn't. If I had to be honest, I probably hadn't walked more than a couple miles in the last three years. I was an out-of-shape, soft, 21st-century American who just traveled back in time, and the thin leather Y-straps that held all my gear in place were digging into my shoulders like a three-year-old who'd never trimmed his nails. I wanted to go back to the future. Now. Well, now I want to read more. Yeah. <laughs> I want to great. stand up and clap. Yay! I'll clap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the things they taught us in maybe middle school writing. Oh, the, great. Oh, no. The very last thing you write is the very beginning. The very last so, thing. Yeah, you know what? Like that you happened. Go, you go back and you write the intro totally. paragraph after you know exactly what your argument is going to be like, sure. how you build your case, how you conclude. Yeah. So was that the case there, or did yeah. you come home and no. scribble about Stalingrad and then go off on your next adventure? Well, no, that's a great point. I realize now that my level of writing is middle school writing now that I know that. It's <laughs> the <laughs> basics. You're that's all our guess, Becky. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. It's true. You know, that, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because right before I handed in my last draft, I changed the beginning. Yep. Because I realized that um, the beginning stank and I needed to change it. And it wasn't, I wanted to get into the action right from the very beginning. I didn't want to get in anything expository. I just wanted to get into the action. I wanted people to be there with me. I wanted them to get a sensation of what it was like. And um, I, I, uh, not that I, yeah, I, I, the book is, is very descriptive in that way. It's first person, obviously. It's all about my experience, um, you know, living through 10 different time periods. And I wanted just to capture them right from the very beginning. And, and one of the things that I did, I mean, we're going to talk about the writing process a little bit, but, you know, I love bookstores and I would go, and, and even just on, uh, you know, ebooks or whatever, I would always try to, uh, I'd go into bookstores and I'd pick up a book. And I would look at the first chapter, and I'd read the first chapter, and if the first chapter didn't grab me, I'd be like, I'm never going to buy that book. I got really, really particular about this, and maybe it's unfair to do that, but at the same time, I re realize that people have so many choices. You know, they don't have to read a book. I'm asking them to do a lot to do this. That's a long commitment to read a book. Um, so what I wanted to do was grab them right from the very beginning and say, you must continue to read this because what's going to happen to me? You know, and that question kind of went 
run through my head. What's next? What happens next? What happens next? Is, is he going to get out of this? What, you know? And I also wanted to set the tone. I wanted it to be, have just humorous interjections here and there. Not, enough, not too much, but enough. And people realized, okay, this is the tone of the book, you know, that this is not a history. This is not a history book, you know. This is a book about somebody learning about history and about this subculture. It's more about, really, it's more a book about hobbies, to be perfectly honest, or about a hobby. Yeah. After you would go on a trip, would you go back and write the chapter for it right, right after? Yeah. That? Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things that was really interesting about writing something so long um, was that, uh, you know, I, and, and immersive, is this experiential journalism, you know, this reportage or whatever, I'm going to throw more, another cinema at, cinema at you, you know, um, you know uh, uh, participatory journalism, you know, is that you have to sort of divide yourself in half. So half of me is completely submerged in whatever I'm doing, and half of me is looking for structure as I'm doing this whole thing. So I'm trying to find out beginning, middle, and end, you know, with each chapter, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, what would work here? What can I write about? Because, you know, the book could be 10,000 pages long if I really wanted it to be. It'd be terrible, but it could be that. So I ha it was often more difficult to figure out, like, what not to put in. And so when I came home, what I would do is, you know, I, was, I would keep notes, and some people were really particular, like, you must keep a... If you're going to keep notes, they must be in a leather-bound book <laughs> so they do not look, like, anachronistic or... Um, <laughs> And I would go home and I would just, I would, you know, write down all the key things that I thought were interesting. And I'd try to figure out the structure of the chapter. This is the beginning. This is where I'm, am I segueing out of chapter two into chapter three? How am I doing that? Blah, blah, blah. And then I would have a very rough, awful, terrible draft that I hope nobody ever sees. And then I would just refine and refine and refine. And then once the book was finished, which was arguably five months before I handed it in, let's say four months before I handed it in, um, it was finished or my, my, my research was finished. And then from there, I could start to look at things like chapter one and say, okay, well, the beginning is not working. So I need to change the way that beginning works. And I can't be afraid to cut, you know, I mean, even now, as I read parts of it, I'm always like, oh, I wish I could cut that line. You know, I, you know, if I were to write the book now, I'd probably rewrite it in an entirely different way. But whatever, you know, it's over. <laughs> Did you find yourself, um, as, as you were split into this fully immersed and also fully um, just observational, did you find yourself kind of forcing things that you knew would just make a great story? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, no, what was hard was figuring out how to continue to make it interesting. Because what happens with the book and what happens with reenactment, and I've discovered this at the end of chapter three, and if, when you read the book, as I'm sure you both will, uh, <laughs> you'll notice that chapter four takes, it changes. Because I started to recognize after the first three chapters that, hmm, you could get into a, a pattern with this, and that is battle, uniform, weapons, experience. Battle, uniform, weapons, experience. Battle, uniforms, weapons, experience. And so the book goes World War II, Civil War, Ancient Rome. Well, okay, there are three different time periods. You learn different things. However, a lot of what was happening was kind of the same. I'd go away. I'd kit up. I'd wear a uniform. I'd go off into battle. And if you do that for 10 chapters, it's going to get really boring. And so Chapter four, I decided that the, the time period was 17th century Poland, and I was just going to spend it with one guy. And so I decided that I needed, rather than trying to force something to be interesting, I needed to figure out what was interesting. And so I decided about around then that I was going to try to cover the, the hobby from 360 degrees. And so then, like one chapter, I talk about the sutlers, these merchants who go to the reenactments, um, or I was going to talk more about the actual history in one chapter. For the last chapter, I create my own reenactment. So it finishes in a different way than I ever would have imagined, you know, starting it off. And it was constantly asking myself, I hate to sound pretentious, but this is really what it's like writing nonfiction. It's like sculpting. So, you know, you have like a piece of, uh, uh, you know, material and, you know, we're all going to shape it differently. You know, we could have a block of stone and one person could create a butterfly and the other person could create a person and the other, you know, could create a bike or whatever. And I knew that using that found material that I wanted to shape it in a way that reflected not only who I was, but also like to try to capture the hobby from, you know, all these different angles. So that was the real challenge mm -hmm. is like, okay, you know, American Revolution, French and New War, how's this going to be different? You know, and I was look, I was seeking out different experiences because of that as well. It wasn't always just going to be a battle. Like I did, I rode a boat down a river, a, a, a replica cargo boat from the 18th century with some people. So it's not all just military based either, you know. 
You're speaking of changing the way you're looking at things as you're writing it and the way that you're, you're going about these reenactments and sharing that experience um, going along. Did, did you pitch this book or did you write it and then pitch it? No, we, we sold it. Yeah. Okay. We, um, and we got advance. I got an advance and, and all that stuff. So yeah. well, the reason I asked that is because what, what, how do things change from when you pitched it to <laughs> as you're going along? I'll let you read my proposal. <laughs> I mean, the first chapter changed significantly. You know, I mean, I probably it's like four thousand words few. You know, fewer than you know. I cut four thousand words. Um, the structure of it changed. Um, hopefully, it's better. You know, um, yeah. I mean, the proposal itself was twenty thousand words. The book is eighty-seven thousand words. I mean, it was a huge proposal. And you know, in proposals like book proposals, they make you sort of like outline what your book is going to be. Well, that's ridiculous, frankly. You know, how could I ever know what the last chapter is going to be? You know, or how could I even know what chapter two is going to be? You know, I can give a sense. I can get an, I have, I have an idea of what that's going to be, but I don't really know until I start doing it. And that's why for me, writing the book, it had to constantly be surprising for me, because I felt if it was constantly surprising for me, it would be constantly surprising for the reader. And there's nothing worse than reading a book that, and, and books tend to not be very surprising sometimes. You know, you're kind of like, there's, a, you know, there's some parts in it where you're just like, oh, can't wait to get to the next chapter, and maybe you'll skip ahead or skim a, you know, a section or whatever. And I didn't want that to be the case. I mean, that might be wishful thinking, but, you know, I, I would have never, in a million years, writing my proposal, I would have never thought, I'm going to dress up as a Spanish friar, I'm going to shave my head, into a tonsure my head into a friar tuck cut, cut called a friar chuck i call it and walk between two missions spanish missions in los angeles and i would have never been able to tell you that because what happened was along the way reenactors were like do you think that you'll become a reenactor and i didn't know what to say i didn't know whether to say well no i didn't want i don't want to offend them and say no i'm writing this book because i'm curious about the hobby and i'm curious about history but that question started to linger in my mind. Well, what would I do? What would be, and it was, gave me a chance to editorialize basically the last chapter. And that was where I was like, okay, if I was going to be a reenactor, what would I do? And so that's why I, and you'll have to read the book to find out why I did that. <laughs> but yeah, it all kind of happens organically. You know, I, 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 I admire people who write histories and, you know, nonfiction books and or, or fiction. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm not that smart. I, I need to just kind of figure it out as I go along. I mean, it's it's hard that way and it's painful, but you know, I, I don't know how anybody could you know ever figure out their endings before they whew, all the power to them. I don't get it. I really don't. But I'm I'm daft. Reenactments are obviously about war, and when I think of our generation. Um, we're basically a generation who hasn't really been asked to experience war in a personal way. Um, and as I put myself in your shoes, just imagining your experience, I sound like I'm obsessed with violence, but that, that would be one of the most shocking parts for me. Like, oh, I am a huge group of people running at that huge group of people. We might, we might be related if you go back far enough. We might not know why we're here. Um, we might not even trust the people who are leading us and that's terrifying even when i watch movies about war i always think wow that that's really terrifying yeah um what were like the huge big picture ruminations that you experienced as you yeah that? that's a great that's a great question i mean you know you're absolutely right and we're more i think more divorced from from war now than at any time <laughs> even in our own lives because you know the it's an all volunteer army uh, military rather armed forces I just wrote a, a piece about this, um, and you know, one of the one of the fears uh, among certain people, uh, military leaders, uh, you know, Stanley McChrystal and academics, is that you know we have this very wide gap right now between the civilian and the military in this country, and we have fewer and fewer people that have anybody in their uh, family who uh, served. Um, certainly my generation, like our grandfathers, uh, served, some of our fathers served in, in Vietnam, but as the, as the military, I think it's 0.5% of the population. So it's a very small percentage. Whereas I think World War II, it was like seven or 9% mm. uh, of people who served. So you have fewer and fewer people serving, right? In, um, and so you have a, a, a more of a disconnect between the civilians and the military. And for me, the bigger thing for the, the bigger takeaway in, in, in many regards with this is, uh, incredible empathy for anybody who wears a, a uniform um, and who uh, 
to, you know, undergoes, uh, you know, and I, this, these were, these were fake wars, you know, let's, let's be clear, you know, but the, the fact that the, the amount that's, that's placed on them, the amount of responsibility, the stress, you know, I think right now we're, uh, you know, in our, in this, in this year in 2012, more soldiers have, uh, have committed suicide than have been killed in action. Um, reservists are being called time and time again. They, they, they didn't, weren't they didn't sign up for that you know typically they'd be called once but some are being called for four or five tours so i have a tremendous empathy for anybody you know who who uh, uh wears a, a uniform at the same time i have the uh, uh, i'm baffled by the fact that anybody could ever wage a war i mean this is a, it is a horrible you know uh, uh, there's a uh, um uh, a war correspondent named uh, Sidney Shamber. He wrote the, the Killing Fields, I believe, and um, you know he said, "The more you know about war, the more you realize that it's insane, bestial, and criminal." You know, and so even just experiencing some simulated situations, like I did a Vietnam reenactment, and this was really disturbing. You know, it was way too close um, to home. And some reenactors said when they found out that I was reenacting this war and doing this, they said, that's not a history, that's a reality. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that happened at that actual reenactment were very disturbing. And, you know, you realize that there's just a tremendous amount of pressure. There was an, there was an experiment um, done at Stanford years ago with the prisons. Uh, uh, they, they took students. And some became guards and some became prisoners. And these are intelligent, Stanford-educated uh, uh, students and within three days, the guards were beating up the prisoners. These are these are kids. I mean, and and they were put in that situation. It doesn't take long that if you immerse yourself in this, if you immerse yourself in this type of uh, you know war reenactment, for you to start to get the mentality. I was like, you know, after like nine hours, I was like, yeah, I could kill somebody. Like I could easily because this is this is terrible, and I don't want to be in this, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get out of it. Wow. And and furthermore, I thought. I don't think that I could live. Like, literally, I, I would probably, I, I don't know, I don't know if I'd take my own life or not, but I think that it would, it's the conditions in which you're placed, the pressure, uh, you know, all these things. And I, I wrote this op-ed, and I I'm hope, I'm hope that it's being accepted, um, in which I say that, you know, the only, for us, for civilians to identify with soldiers, and we need to do this, I think that people actually should be doing this hobby. Mm. And, I, try it for a weekend. Do it for a weekend and see if your opinions don't change about not only our soldiers, but about war being waged. Sorry, that was a really long-winded answer. No, it's fine, but I, I actually have a follow-up question to it. I, I mean, she asked about, um, about the shock of it all and stuff. Did you find yourself kind of becoming desensitized by the end of all this? No. no. <laughs> I wish. No, do I wish? No. Did you have any fear of your readers becoming desensitized by the end of the book? No, no because I tried to convey, you know, the, the Vietnam chapter, there, there are ten chapters, and that was chapter eight, and I tried to convey just how disturbing I felt like the whole thing is. And yes, this was a fake war, but I'm, I can only hope that people walk away from it anti-war. You know, and and that was my experience. And I was never, you know, pro war at, at the beginning of it, but even more so anti war by the end of it. Well, we're coming towards the end of our discussion, so I want to speak with you more about your writing in general. Yes, away from the book. How did you start writing, and and what's in the future for you? Oh wow! So I started off as an actor. And that's terrible. Um, <laughs> if you want, if you want a bad job, may I suggest getting into the dramatic arts? Um, yeah, I, it was basically like you know, as an actor, you're always waiting for somebody to tell you when you can work or not. And I'm kind of a self-starter kind of guy. I got a lot of energy, so I like to do things. And I didn't like looking at telephones and waiting for them to ring. And so I just started goofing around like on the side when I lived in New York and I was in my twenties. And I'd start to just write. And it was terrible. It was always bad. I was always writing a bad play about a farmhouse or something and you know it was just never really went anywhere and then i moved to los angeles and by that time i had written enough bad stuff that i started to get a sense of like okay well i there are some rules to all of this and i started contributing pieces to national public radio and other public radio uh, uh programs and i just found that that medium sort of was a nice marriage between performance 
and writing because you do have to perform as a radio uh, person, as you know. You know, it's like you're going to be on the air. You need to use your voice in a particular way, and blah, blah, blah. So I liked it because I could just sort of talk it. You know, I could just say what I wanted to say, and I didn't feel like I was writing. I felt like I was speaking, and I liked that. And I liked going out, and I liked meeting people, and I liked talking to people, and I liked finding out like, what people did, and I always got interested in their hobbies, and that was really kind of my trigger. And I started contributing a lot to a show called Weekend America, and I did a lot of things based around people's hobbies. And so I got fascinated by people, how you know, like they spent their downtime. You know, it's like, what do you do in your downtime? Everybody always says, what do you do for a living? Well, I don't think that's an interesting question. I think it's more like, what do you do in your downtime? Because that really says a lot about you. And so that just one thing led to another, and then um, this idea came about because I had worked at a Renaissance fair many years ago as an actor and I was always curious about the people who came dressed as Elizabethans and you know my own experience not learning about history and I kind of felt like well this is a great way to blend the two and so it was really daunting for me because I don't really consider myself to be a writer in that regard it's like I still consider myself to be sort of an actor guy who turned into a writer a radio dude and I'm a radio dude that's not a really good description but anyway you know I so when I wrote this book I actually spoke it out loud as I was writing it and like I remember, like the last draft, like I sat in my apartment in L.A. And it was like eighty-seven thousand words, and I'm like, I said to my wife, I was like, this weekend I'm just going to be talking to myself, you know. So I would read it out loud because I wanted it to have the rhythm of a person talking in your ear. So you know, hopefully that comes across. And you know, some of the reviews have been like a companionable writer because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an academic, you know. It's yeah. like I'm not an intellectual, and and I just I wanted this to be like the average guy's you know experience, and hopefully the average reader. I think that's funny that you bring up uh, being fascinated with people's downtime because literally, unrelated to this, before you got here, Becky and I were having a discussion and she said, I believe the quote was, I never really think about what people do when they're not doing things. And she's like, it's so interesting. Because we were talking about bloggers and how it takes so much time. And she's like, both both of us are talking about how we have things in our lives that take up a a lot of time, hobbies and stuff. But but there are people who do hobbies that you don't see that you know yeah like blocking and stuff. absolutely and there's a fascinating world out there of people who are completely obsessed and once you start to scratch that a little bit it opens up this whole you know it's like this pandora's box it's like whoa and like all the money that people spend on it and you get this this whole language and this vocabulary that people have developed you know whatever like if they're into you know knitting or if they're into you know mushroom hunting or whatever you know it's like this real obsessive and i love that i loved i love meeting passionate people because um i feel like they're the most interesting people you know? You know, like, wow, they're really into that. What? Let's let's see what their life is like. Let's spend a couple of days with them and just see what that's like. I, I, that's to me, that's fascinating. That's what's beautiful about America because there's so many people like that. And I thought everyone was just watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> So what about the future? What's next with yeah. you and writing? Okay, so me and writing. Um, good question. Uh, I've got a bunch of little things that are coming out um, that are related to the book, but I'm actually moving to Hong Kong in, in five weeks in early September. My wife just got a job there, and I'm going to go there, and I'm going to be teaching at a school in Hong Kong, and um, I'm hoping that another book comes out of it. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I think for me, it, I've got to live a little bit to see what else uh, comes up because – um, like I said, it's like for me to sit in a room and, you know, read a bunch of books and then write a book about that. Not so interesting, much more interesting to me for me to be out experiencing things and then write about it. Because I feel like that's where you really learn is by meeting people, talking to people and, and just kind of sniffing around and just seeing what's interesting. Well, Charlie, if our listeners are uh, interested in finding your book or contacting you, how can they do that? So I have a website, charlieschroeder.com and the book, uh, there are links there to buy the book, but you know, um, and major retailers. Um, there are many signed copies at a local bookstore. I don't know if I can mention the name on air, but um, uh, which is over on the Fruitville Pike. Uh, and there are signed copies there for you. And yeah, any online retailer that uh, you may be familiar with as well. I don't know if I can drop names or not, but you know, it's a it's like it's like a rainforest. <laughs> this is it's a rain- I feel like I'm there and I'm talking to you. It's like a rainforest of books. <laughs> and and then of course the uh the bricks and mortar place here in town. And uh yeah, and and shoot me an email if you if you read the book. I'd l- I love hearing from people. It really honestly, like I've gotten all these reviews and it's been really great and yada yada, but the the emails that mean the most to me are the are the are the people who uh who write and say, "I really liked your book." The ones that don't mean as much to me are the ones where people are like, I hate your book. <laughs> so if you hate my book, just say you liked it. 
Oh, the best kind of criticism is the fake kind of criticism. Exactly. <laughs> I don't like constructive criticism. I don't like any criticism. No. <laughs> but no, if you, if I would love it, you know, and, and I'm hoping that people do read it. Yeah, because it it is, you know. I hope anybody who's ever wanted to learn a little bit about history will read this book because it's a great introduction to the subject and it's done in a fun, lively way. That was kind of my objective with the book. I hope that a whole new generation of people are turned on by the subject like I am now. Well, from all of us here, I, I, once again, I want to thank you for coming on the show. And I especially want to thank our fans for bringing you to our attention. Um, uh, someone on Twitter actually told us that you were in town and uh, we weren't able to get in touch. I think you were even in town twice after that or something, but we finally got, we were able to set things up and it's been a lot of fun. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. We hope you've been enjoying the Langcast. This episode was produced by myself, David Moulton, with show notes by Lawrence Lesser. All pertinent links to this episode can be found in the show notes at thelancast.com. If you specifically liked this episode, we ask that you consider making a donation. Every little bit helps. Even a dollar a show can keep us going. If you would like to help support us in that way, you can visit thelancast.com slash donate. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and tell a friend about the show. So, for the Lancast, I'm David Moulton. And I'm Becky Svensson. Asking, are you in the cast? <laughs>